So, <laughs> I understood very little of what uh, Roberto just said. What's happening? You can make a lot of noise. I always make a lot of noise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is my job. So go on. This is my job <laughs> to make noise. If I'm too quiet, then nobody can hear me. But if I'm too loud, then I make too much noise. Okay. It's part of the problem. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I understood very little. I did, I did understand Amore d'Italia, which I think is uh, something about me loving Italy, which is very true. I feel very honored to spend time in this place. Um, so my name is Miles Cooper Seaton. I live in Los Angeles, California currently, but I've been traveling a lot over the last year to, to Italy and spending a lot more time here and kind of increasingly I identifying I cre increasingly with uh, the culture here, which is really, really lovely. Um, so I'm really, I feel very honored to be here. I'm also, I mean, I think he probably mentioned that I'm a musician, so I make time-based art, so I want to qualify. A lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about in terms of creativity relate specifically to time-based art, and, and my understanding of, of art um, is really just seen through the lens of my life in that way, and my experience is mostly making time-based art, not making things or objects. Um, so this is kind of a... I always want to use that as a qualification, so when I talk about art, that's I'm usually talking about uh, temporal forms. So, um, I, uh, I also, because I'm a musician, uh, I'm used to talking about philosophical matters or ideas in the context of a performance, and I feel very comfortable singing and performing and playing music and I don't feel so comfortable talking raw and by itself. So I really appreciate you and your patience to actually listen to me today. Um, the first thing that I'd like to try to do uh, is um, this small uh, kind of exercise that I've passed out. Um, yeah. I'm going to read it in, in English, but I have had it translated into Italian by a friend of mine. So I hope the translation's good. Um, it's, you know, I feel like I just, I have kind of take a generally spiritual view towards life. That's just my kind of way of looking at things. I can totally, I'm totally happy to look at nihilism in the face. This is no problem for me. But to me, if you look at things spiritually or you look at things nihilistically, Either way, you can look at listening and empathy as a very practical quality of life. To me, it's part of the very definition of what it means to be human, is to practice empathy. So um, even if you look at the definition, a quick definition of, of what it means to be human, it, it talks about relating to, relating to a human, human form. It talks about kind of this relativity and to me, this kind of relativity, um, relativity kind of uh, would denote proximity, which basically talks about us and others. It talks about the way that we relate to other people. Um, just in the sense of relativity, you acknowledge other. And I think that to me, so the point is to be human really is to be with other humans. It's to be classified with other humans. Um, so I want to start with this listening practice because one of the things that I also think about a lot as, a, as an artist and as a, as, a, as a creative person and as a musician is, um, 
it, because I primarily deal in sound, I think about how uh, most of life, for me, comes down to sound and light. I don't actually envision life having some kind of solid form at any point. And so to me, the very uh, existence uh, of life is this lack of solidity. So the boundaries that we imagine are really ones that we can kind of create and are very pliable. And that's the boundaries of reality, whether you're thinking in those terms or just the boundaries between people um, and uh, the boundaries between who we are and how we see ourselves as well, which I think is, is something that I can get to a little more. So if we can start with the listening practice um, quickly, if you guys want to do this with me. If, what I'd like is for everyone, if you can, do this with me and trust me for just a moment. I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you don't, you can, you, I can, I can leave my wallet in the middle of the room in case you guys are worried. Uh, okay, so. When sitting, if you can first close your eyes. Next, familiarize yourself with the sensations in your body. Make a mental checklist of the regions. This is not to judge, it's simply to pay attention. And then gently but actively acknowledge the top of your head, the muscles in your face, your jaw. Is it relaxed? Your neck, your throat, your shoulders. Are they relaxed? Your chest, the muscles in your back, your abdomen, your thighs, your legs, down to the ankles and your feet. You can feel the ground beneath you. And then next, simply just draw your attention to your breath. Feel the air as it enters and exits your lungs. And when you are feeling in your body, imagine that there is a small circle around you and begin to open your ears. Focus on the sounds around you and where they're coming from, from left or right, from near or far. Can you feel them traveling to you? If you're indoors, are they coming from inside or outside? Are they reflecting off the walls in the room? Are they changing as they reflect? Are they coming from multiple directions? If it is possible, observe the process of identifying these sounds. Are they familiar? Is there a tone in these sounds? Is there a rhythm in these sounds? Okay. So, when I was, uh, my very first memory is when I, one of my very first memories is, is, is singing with my, my family in a church. And uh, my mother has a very beautiful voice, and she's singing very beautifully. And then my, my grandmother, her voice, so so. And then there's maybe a couple of people singing in front and then behind, and <laughs> their voices are very different. Because I'm young, so I'm not so much distinct. You know, I can say now, looking back, that their voices were very out of tune with the rest of the group. 
But when I, when I distinguished each of these voices and I noticed the difference in the characteristics, it was like very, it's, I think back and have this memory, it was this very strong memory of feeling myself in relation to these other people. And this is very strong feeling of now understanding what I do about music and, and, and having all of this kind of like experience and taste and all this other stuff that kind of can sometimes you know, inform but also impede my creativity. I, um, yeah, I, I look back and I think, yeah, these people have pretty terrible voices sometimes, you know. They have, but, but what the point was is that when they <coughs> merged with the whole of the sound, they were absolutely integral to the experience that was created when all of these voices blended as one and we became, this was the expression to me of whatever kind of thing that the, pastor and my church is, as a child was, you know, a, a Protestant church. So they're ta this person's talking about the body, the one body and all these things. And, you know, of course, we, I'm sure that in Italy, we, I know that there's a very different relationship to religion and I can totally understand this, which is something that I plan to address a little bit. But for myself, uh, as I continued to sort of go along my journey, I had to kind of understand and recontextualize this experience that I had with people talking about this, these kinds of religious situations. So it was useful to me to go back into those conversations and hear this person talking about this kind of oneness and this wholeness and understand that I had experienced this very physical and very palpable and very practical situation of people kind of joining together in the fact that they were all hearing this sound, maybe in their own subjective way, but also that everyone was unified by this sonic space that we were creating together and also by just simply our air and our molecular kind of bonding that was occurring in the sound and in our breath as we all sat and shared space and time together, which to me is what's happening now. It's what's happening when we actually engage the world is that we are sharing our lives with other people. So as, a, as an artist, I think that for me, one of the main things, especially as time goes on and technology continues to create more of a kind of strange abstraction and abstract field that kind of overlays life and sometimes can be this amazing tool and sometimes can kind of stand in the way of us being able to relate to ourselves and to others, um, is that I find myself again searching for some kind of meaningful thing or some sort of purpose to my art and to my work as a person. Because what we can say is that as the concentration of wealth changes, right, I'm not going to get too political, but it is real to acknowledge that wealth is not distributed as much as it was. And so as people continue to have the kind of resources drained from the whole, less and less people become wealthy, we end up in a situation where as creative people, we, not only as a means to survive, but also as a means to, to, to find some impetus to continue to create, can't totally be motivated by financial means anymore because the rewards are just not available to us as they once were. We can't trick ourselves into thinking that. So it's just a very practical thing. Again, you don't have to talk about the morality of it. It's a very practical thing to just look for this purpose, because the purpose is the thing that's going to drive us. The purpose is the thing that's going to actually feed us when it all comes down to it. And it's going to be our relationship to other people that's going to be the thing that's going to carry us through the world. Because when it starts to get cold and your heat's not working, you need to call your neighbor. This is just a very basic thing. This is how it started. Um, so for me, my experience with this kind of church thing led to uh, moving into later into playing hardcore music and being a very, being in, in uh, a very kind of outside situation, feeling very outside of, um, of culture, feeling very outside, feeling living in a, a sense of, with a sense of kind of exile from my community and my world. And, um, you know, I, I, I had some really amazing formative experiences with LSD that really shook my, you know, my kind of understanding of reality. As a teenager, I started to look for purpose and I can have, I have these very palpable memories every step of the way of being completely lost, walking into a room, some older gentleman guy with the, diff, you know, cool hair and whatever at the, at the, at the hardcore show 
comes to me and says, ah, I haven't seen you before. What's your name? Oh, you play music? Come play with my band. This drawing me into this community, giving me a sense of space, this person seeing me and me feeling seen immediately changes my life. Gives me a sense of purpose, gives me a sense of safety, gives me a sense of belonging. Somebody coming and finding me. This is a very simple action. And for this guy, he's older, his practicality could be kicking in and understanding a sense of survival. He sees someone young, he realizes what he does is irrelevant if the culture dies. So he just has to preserve himself. It's just a level of self-preservation. But the reality is that in that situation, in that desire to breathe, simply to breathe, what he finds is that his breath is in me, his breath is in someone else. And to me, this is, this is like riveting. This is really important information for me to try to find and for me to like actually apply to my life and to my artwork. Is that on a basic level, when we are looking for help, when we're looking for our own breath, we find it in others. This is really the truth. We can, and I, and I, I feel like, you know, this is something to be discussed. Of course, this is my truth, I can say that, but I don't need to qualify it. I can say what I mean, I guess. <laughs> but as I, as I continued to sort of explore these different things, eventually it led me into a, you know, wild, wild darkness. We don't need to talk about all the terrible things, but at one point, I, 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 I wound up in another sense, in another place of, of deep hopelessness and desperation. I moved from this and had a lot, a, a commu another community that really saved me from where I was at that wasn't a church community. But it was, it was, it was, a, it was a group of people kind of gathered together by a, a common need of, of helping one another. And they started to familiarize me with the notion of uh, myself as a, with myself as, as a servant to the world in some respects. And this idea of, of selflessness and service has been something that I've continued to sort of try to, to um, keep an eye on as life has gone on. I've tried to continue to sort of understand at every stage of what I'm doing how I can, how I can collect myself, come back from all of the things and all of my dreams and desires and, and things that I want to remind myself that it is in others that I'm going to find myself. It's in other people and in, the, and, and in seeing other people that I'm going to be able to, to, to find myself and to be able to find my way. And so I had this experience with, a, I'll tell another quick story. Um, so the community that I was involved in is, is called Alcoholics Anonymous. This is, this is very personal information that I'm sharing, but why not? And so I'm, I'm 20, 20 something years old and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the hospital, I come from the hospital, um, different people are, are sitting with me, they're feeding me, they're taking care of me, they're drawing me into their homes. It's this very, like, amazing community, right? So, I, I, as soon as I'm from the hospital, I'm kind of crazy, I end up encountering a woman named Darlene Narkowitz. Darlene Narkowitz is this really kind of exuberant, very strange, crazy woman. Her teeth are all false. She's crazy. She's one of these people who was doing heroin for however many years. It's just very like wild, but she, she's a person who takes people into her home and helps them to get off heroin, just in this very basic way. Feeds them soup, cleans them when they're covered in their own mess. It's just a real angel, yeah? So someone who really, but for her, she has found this sense of ability to save herself by helping other people. She's not asking for money, none of this stuff. Darlene and I became really close, and she started to talk with me about my life and my purpose. Because at this time, when I was in this, in this hopelessness, there was no sense of purpose for me. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had, been, I had already stopped playing music. I'd already stopped thinking about any of this stuff. All I wanted to do was just live. I just had finally realized that I wanted to live, and I had made this choice. But what Darlene shared with me was that it was my duty as a person to try to find my purpose. And if I really felt like I wanted to be a musician, that I really needed to acknowledge this purpose and I needed to understand how, as a creative person and as a musician in my case and as a singer, that I was responsible for carrying some kernel of humanity to people, that there was some way that this was my duty was to acknowledge my service to the world through 
this action and through this, creates this creative process. And what she said to me, the words that she used was that you have to consider yourself a priest, which I know, of course, we have this very intense relationship with this potentially in Italy. We also have it in America, whatever. But she used these terms. And so I guess the thing that I really wanted to come to in this is that in these last years, these last two years specifically, um, after meeting Darlene, Darlene ended up dying from AIDS six months later after we had this conversation. And I realized that I was left without my structure, but with this very simple kind of notion that was a little bit vague that I had to go and discover for myself that I needed to, 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 to find a way to function as someone who uh, kind of acknowledged and um, brought some sense of uh, a higher calling to the world and, and, and acted as some sort of reflective surface for people as a performer, for people to be able to see the wonderful aspects of themselves. And so for me, creative, creative people, that, people that create things, people that make beautiful things, people that are trying to, to put things into the world, art in general is simply a, it's, a, it's, it's taking life and making it understandable and it's turning it into a parable form, something that we can read, something that we can understand. Um, and as a performing artist, I'm, I feel like I, my job is to do this with, with, with people in the moment. Because from my understanding, time and life is very short. And we have no idea when it's going to end. It's a very, very, and anybody who's seen me perform knows that I, I talk about this a lot, I think about this a lot, that our life is made up of a collection of seconds. We have really, really no way to tell what's happening, but when we're in the moment and when we're actually present in ourselves, we can feel life, we can feel others, we have some, there is some way to kind, of, to kind of extend what we understand as our life. I feel like an arts job, as opposed to entertainment, which is to acknowledge all of this suffering, to give people a chance to be entertained, to forget the fact that their feet are tired, that life is kind of pulling them down into the ground, that they, they need to escape sometimes because, man, it's really hard. Like, life can feel fucking hard. Like, people die, all kinds of terrible things happen. And so sometimes you just need to, like, drink something and listen to the sound and be carried away and forget. But art can be a situation where people are allowed, especially time-based art, to be pulled further back in to themselves to the point that they go deep enough into, the, into themselves that they discover the well beneath all people. They discover that collective unconscious that Jung would talk about. They discover others at the other, when you go to the, I, I can't remember who said it, but when you go to the other end of the rainbow, you find other people's minds, you know? And this quote was always really, of course, as a psychedelic lover, wow. But it's really true. You know, when you go deep enough into yourself, what you find is, is commonality. You don't find, you've, you find something very personal, very personal, and as you crack through the surface, you find something that's like this sparkling void that is pregnant with potential, with the feelings and thoughts of other peoples, and with like relationships, with meaning that you find in the other people. And art, especially time-based art, because I'm very par par partial <laughs> to this as my practice, really acknowledges the nobility in spending time, in sharing. And this is something that I feel like, if I come back to this mildly politicized statement that I made about wealth distribution, is that as everything continues to be codified and commodified, and we have this notion that even the word share is connected to us clicking something on a screen that then broadcasts our feelings to everyone at once. This is, a, this is this heavily transactional experience. Not only are we giving people something to consume, they're consuming it through a vector that turns it completely into content and drains the actual time and space out of it. 
We're also in a situation where we don't acknowledge that sharing is something that happens in time. We, we can easily forget that sharing connotes us being together. It's not something that you can take. You can't take it away with you. You can't eat it specifically. But what can happen is that the experience that you have with other people in time, the, the shared experience, can give you a greater sense of yourself, can give you a greater sense of purpose, and can give you, through this understanding of other people, through this sharing of, of time and space, and through the acknowledgement of that as a choice, I really do, I feel like we can reclaim our basic humanity and we can, we can, we can truly d rediscover what it means to be alive. Because I don't think that life is being taken from us so much as I feel like we're in a situation now where we're at the critical point as wealth is continuing to sort of be held not captive, but as it's continuing to be kind of drained into these like small pools, we feel very marginalized because we have less access to the thing that we're told is going to make us happy. But what ends up happening is that we, we actually have everything we need here in front of us right now, for the most part. We have each other. We have the thing that when we go to breathe, we look for others. So I feel like I'm reaching some sort of conclusion. I haven't really actually looked at the time. I, don't, I wish that I could be a little bit more, uh, I feel like I, I, I went over my points for this talk. I wrote a lot of things down and I felt very concerned and preoccupied initially with wanting to have some sort of form, wanting to come up with something that would be very easy to understand that I could package. And then I realized that I was surrendering in my mind to this process of wanting to make something that I could essentially sell you, something that you could consume, something that would be easy for you to take, that you could wrap up with you, and then you could take with you, and you could be like, oh, cool, I have this little thing, and then you could have it in somewhere in the 65 gigabytes of email <laughs> that's just there, you know, that could give you more content, I could give you more data, but the reality is I can't, I can't really do that. What I can do is I can ask the question, of you, what is, what is your life? What is your life? And I think that if we can kind of start to like look at what our life is, you know, you can really, you start to see that it's a collection of experiences, it's a collection of time, and, and those times usually can be measured by our relationships, by the people around us. And we can start to see that as we, we view the world in this sense of ourselves through others, as we continue to try to look more to others for the, the, the happiness of others and the benefit of others, we see that we, as one people, become more and we, come, we become more and more happy. Our, our social situation becomes more and more gratifying, and we feel less and less the need to go to consumption to be able to be happy. And what this creates is a situation where we start to acknowledge a new value of our lives. We can start to become very, very wealthy people. We can start to feel a sense of wealth and we can start to cut the cord of feeling marginalized and we can start to create a situation where we actually, we actually do feel this wealth. We actually do feel this affluence. We do feel this happiness. We do feel this sense of purpose. So, um, yeah. I feel like, uh, I don't know what the time is, like I said, but I, I feel very, very grateful to be able to spend time with people, to be able to take um, a moment to be able to just share time with all of you, regardless of <laughs> what you take away from this experience. For me, the, the feeling of being able to um, have you pay me your attention, to be able to actually have you listen is, is such an amazing gift. And so um, I, I very much uh, I, I appreciate that and I'm very happy to be here. So if anybody wants to continue to have this conversation, I'm gonna be having breakfast. I would love to be able to talk with people. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you very much to my hosts. <laughs>